Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vaidyanathan, someone who wears his brilliant academic qualifications and many achievements very lightly, as you can see. He's also the only professor we know who manages to inject a big dose of humor into his understanding of data and management concepts, usually by linking them to everyday situations. No wonder. He has been named as among the 10 best professors or at all IIMs by the Business Today magazine. Professor Vaidyanathan is a uh, professor of finance and control at IIM Bengaluru. He did his master's from the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta and is a fellow in management, that's doctorate, from IIM Calcutta where he taught for about four years. His areas of interest are corporate finance, investments, portfolio management, risk management and pensions. And he studied very closely the credit rating mechanisms of major agencies like Standard & Poor and Moody's. But in all this, what is really heartening to us is that despite his incredible professional and academic work being so closely tied to the large formal sector and big companies and big regulators, his heart is, is with the small and informal sector. For over a decade, he has tried to open the eyes of policymakers that it is not a reliance or an ONGC alone that drives the economy and the country. It's the millions of small entrepreneurs. By focusing on them, Professor Vaidyanathan has shown that he is that wise academic who would go where his data and information would take him. We have all benefited from that wisdom that emanates from this pure search for the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Professor Vaidyanathan a rousing welcome to this forum. Uh, thank you, um, Sucheta, and uh, thank you, Basu. Of course, thank uh, our florist for the <laughs> lovely flowers, and thank all the audience on a Friday evening to you know, spare your time to be here. And uh, my relationship with Sucheta, I think, goes back. Uh, quite a number of years. I invited her a couple of times to our institute to come and give a talk. After uh, having been uh, more uh, involved with her writings and other things, post uh, Harshad Mehta Times actually. I have, they have a lovely book incidentally on uh, the scam and that's one of the books I used to prescribe for my, even today several chapters from that for reading for the capital market uh, student may be very very interesting and uh, fascinating in those days of course initially i thought you know dalal and other name and you know something big is uh, and she comes and says no we have to reform we have to regulate and then uh, you know these are all i thought something you know money tree is being called and you know you shake and something will come out of it nothing she wanted to reform and change the system. I was very impressed with it. <laughs> okay. A lot of people ask, why do you write books? Because nowadays nobody reads anything. Why waste your time? At least if you are my student, I can say that, you know, it's a compulsory reading and other thing. And they will ask which chapters are, which pages. <laughs> Full book, nobody is going to read. It doesn't matter. If you buy and read it, it is uttamam. It's the best thing, right? If not, at least buy. If you don't read. That is uh, middle level, right? Madhyamam we call it. Adamam or worst level is not buying it. So don't do that. So either way you keep it, right? Okay. Now the initiative for this, uh, I will just come back to that. Before that, uh, I think... Uh, we should have some, you know, some sort of a uh, global understanding what is happening and how we are not <coughs> identical or same as uh, that of what is happening in the world uh, uh, situation or scene. If you look at the global thing, this is what is happening actually. Even though we talk about uh, crisis, when there was a crisis in uh, Thailand and uh, Indonesia and partly Philippines, not in Malaysia, it was called Asian financial crisis. There was a crisis in Argentina, Chile and uh, Latin American financial crisis. Now, when there is a crisis in uh, Ireland, uh, 
Greece and uh, France and Germany, uh, not Germany, France and uh, now the England is also getting into it, Italy and uh, it is called global financial crisis. This is something very interesting. When the crisis is in Argentina, it is Latin American. When the crisis is in Ireland and uh, Portugal, it becomes a Global. Actually, what is happening is very interesting. If you take G7, the you know lot of you, I'm sure most of you would have heard about G7. Now it has become uh, what is that called G20. When there is a crisis, you know we tend to get more people involved so that you know everybody per capita crisis comes down. That type of a feel again. You know? In organizations also same thing. When you can't solve a problem, you add more people and uh, try to uh, look at it. So G7 has become G20, but the original G7 had 51% of the global income. Adjusted for purchasing power parity, we won't go into all those technical issues, that uh, it's purely in terms of comparable basis. In 1990, not very far actually, and today they have, uh, in, it was supposed to happen in 1918, uh, 2018, it has happened earlier itself, they have something like 36 percent and the emerging markets have got 52 percent. This is something which has uh, very, very interesting implication on a global scale. Otherwise what is popularly called the axis of economic power has shifted from the G7 to the emerging market. Emerging market mainly India, China, Brazil and Indonesia. These are the four big numbers actually. So this is what has uh, taken place. The axis has shifted. Somewhere in uh, 2008 somebody asked me how long it will take to recover one of the business channels. I told it will take 40 quarters to recover. That girl was very clever. 40 by 4, you mean 10 years, sir, she asked. I told 40 by 4 is normally 10, irrespective of the channel, right? So after that, I was never interviewed by any of these uh, channels because they thought this fellow is a crackpot crack or pessimist or whatever you call it, right? This was in 2008. Very recently, again, uh, somebody came and asked how long it will take. I told 80 quarters. <laughs> It even 20 years. You see, we are teachers normally. We don't, even if a student gets five marks, we tell that there is a scope for improvement. You know, we don't, uh, you know, nowadays you have to be very cautious also. If you tell him you are useless or something, he may go to Human Rights Commission and other things. So, everywhere there is a. The other day, one fellow was not submitting the projects in time. I told you have become lazy. That boy it was very upset. I thought he was upset because I am telling him, no, sir, don't use lazy. You say, I am differentially motivated. <laughs> so, it's a sort of everything is now, one has to be cautious, right? So, when I told 80 quarters, what I meant, I told her, it is never going to recur. So, the fundamental principle I think we should internalize, very, very difficult to internalize it, is the era of G7 is over. And why it is difficult to internalize? Because we are, umbilical cords are with G7. Our genetic structure is linked to them. In terms of so many things, education, uh, what one can call children, our uh, you know, linkages, hundreds of linkages are there with those countries. So it is always very difficult for us to, so that is why you see in the television, you see in the paper, when are they going to recover? And that recovery has become more critical for us, even though it is not as we will demonstrate very soon. So this is what uh, significantly has taken place. And uh, when did this uh, start? Actually, 18, till 1820, ourselves and China had something approximately 50% of the global GDP. Till 1820. So 200 years only, actually this uh, Europe and US had a dominant position. So in a sense, we are what... Uh, Angus Madison calls the economist who constructed the global GDP from period uh, 0 till 1908. It was a OECD project. He says you should call India and China as re-emerging markets. The correct terminology is not emerging markets. Actually, they are re-emerging or recover, you know, they are going where they were in before to 1820. It's a 200-year in-between period. So that itself is something which is interesting to 
look why have they gone into this why have they come to this very simple they have a huge amount of aggregate debt the indebtedness of these countries have phenomenally increased and these are all something like uh, december january data now it is much more canada has crossed 300% and uh, us is more than 300% our own britain is 500% now our own britain because sooner or later we have to run that country <laughs> i'm telling you they are in deep deep pits they will come to us in some way or other take over and run it japan is beyond imagination huge amount of indebtedness have come of this broadly when you say debt three major components are there one is what is called the government debt or what is called the sovereign debt other is corporate debt third is household debt these are the three broad categories government debt in a sense can always be managed because every government has access to equivalent of our nasik press very simple you print more and in india actually one should say that uh, telgi you know they also have some time access to that uh, he comes from my state so i should uh, stress that point somebody told of course we have the the note printing uh, in charge here so we should mention it more so government debt is something of course there are implication when you print notes it will be inflation and so many things you are not going into that but technically government debt is sovereign debt is you no know, by and large it is never uh, renewed or it is never forgot but corporate debt is different but again corporate debt you know if i borrow 40 lakh from canara bank i will every month sit with my wife and worry how to pay the emi and other thing but if i had borrowed 400 crore who will worry <laughs> canara bank will worry actually <laughs> their gm will ring up how is your husband how is he is he doing well is he he is worried you know so the relationship is in terms of the quantum which you have once you cross after that like our my own city this uh, airline man former airline man he is going around happily smiling and uh, sbi what is sbi as sbi for him is a three letter word he doesn't know about sbi sbi is so very 8100 crores which is tied up so the bank corporate debt to banks is of different kitty and sometime or other like countries like india the government will pitch in and then fund the banks the npa of banks is going up you know we had the story of indian bank so many of these exam but the third actual wmd weapon of mass destruction is the household debt and that is what is uh, phenomenally destroying these countries household debt is significant and uh, many of these countries uh, it's uh, something like uh, more than nearing 100% of the gdp and not only that individual households do not have any concept of saving anymore that six letter word is out of the dictionary what is saving nobody knows saving is not there actually one of the reason is the another six letter word family has significantly as an institution come down and one of the critical reason originally for saving was the family as an institution so that has also gone so there is a compounding crisis in terms of saving problem of so households are all womb to tomb in terms of debt indebtedness average household in us has got 15 uh, credit cards and aggregate uh, credit sanction used to be 8 trillion they have brought it to 3 trillion it's a huge and then there is a educational loan then we all know about the housing loan uh, issues so for everything households have started on a borrowing spree and many of the european households saving rate is as low as 1% 1.2% and some of them are negative actually this is a sort of a massive crisis which have engulfed the G7 countries, and uh, not only that, the household debt I was telling about, the family as an institution is going away. Roughly half of U.S. birth last year were outside marriage. They are sitting on a literal time bomb. Actually, New York Times says illegitimacy has become a new norm. 
and in the process one third is single parent family in the single parent family is a big jargon used by newspapers and television it is actually single woman family they run the show and in the process they have to depend on state funding good amount of funding comes from the state and uh, in uk some of you might have seen uh, year before last year the kids were writing on the streets for two days two full days they were on the street looting and uh, taking away goods and uh, everything was happening actually the cops were more or less tolerant rather they didn't try to and i was in manchester one shop was not attacked at all by anybody that is a bookshop which is in the <laughs> center of manchester you can understand so they constituted a committee archbishop of uk was also member of the committee finance minister was there chancellor of exchequer they found the archbishop was telling there are more households with tvs than fathers in uk they found out sorority of the families gone the committee report is a must read it's available on the website what is the fundamental problem of uk they are enunciating it's not able to and uh, most of the single parent families are whether one likes it or not all over the world between age of 3 to 13 that what the report says father is looked upon as a control variable i will tell up you know sort of i will and the kids also believe at that age that really father is the head of the as well as they grow old they understand things are <laughs> not as we believed in the beginning but when you are so young you can you know get away with it but there is an associated issue also with this lot of guilds you know guilds are very famous in europe as well as in uk large number of student do not uh, go to university after schooling most of them go for these uh, skills in terms of plumbing fitting carpentry hundreds of skills and there are equivalent of what you can call the iti's of india their registration has significantly fallen because of the problem associated with the single parent family the at that age there are not enough people to push them into these avocations so they are having a huge problem of not only unemployed youth unemployable youth and the unemployment rate has phenomenally increased see spain's jobless rate youth youth in of course in europe is very clearly defined 16 to 24 and like in india you know 44 45 sometimes 60 also is youth here actually you never know actually if 60 is youth many of you are not at born actually you can be very but there it is very rigorously defined the rate is nearly 50 percent it's a massive thing actually for them at that age if you are unemployed and that's why in greece portugal spain lot of local level huge amount of violence and mugging and other problems have started so they are literally sitting on a tender box and because of the unemployable youth they also have huge amount of migration from other countries on an average per day anywhere between 600 to 1500 people are entering europe most of the low level jobs what are called brown collar jobs in europe today is done by outsiders cleaning the restaurant garbage removal road cleaning picking uh, uh, grapes all these jobs are done by outsiders and many of these outsiders are coincidentally are also muslims so whenever there is a economic downturn you tend to blame the migrants all over the world this is a very common thing whether it is uh, mumbai or whether it is uh, france or whether it is us so all these people so what has happened is the anti migrant thing has also become into a anti muslim thing europe is literally sitting on a tender cake to the extent significant amount of victories have been made by the french la pen party that's extreme right actually people who are writing you know multiple amount of articles about uh, india getting a uh, fascist dictator soon but they just ignore in their own backyard what type of a development is taking place so europe is in acute problem associated with them there is another issue is there is a huge amount of significant amount of decline in population europe had 
one fourth of the world population in the first world war. Every fourth person was a European. Today it is 10 percent. In another 15 years, it's going to become two and a half to three percent. So Europe is having a acute shrinkage of population. Of that, Russia is the worst sufferer. Between today and uh, 10 years down, 15 percent of Russia will not be there. If there are 100 Russian today, there will be only 85 Russians. We are not talking about rate of growth or anything. Of course, in this side, Asia, Japan is facing the same problem. Japan is really shrinking. And Japan facing acute problem because they don't encourage migration also. Right? There is a supposed to be a body called Project Aging by the King of Japan. I am also put there as a member. I don't know. Maybe I am getting aged. That could be the only reason. <laughs> Every time we discuss, their girls are not getting married. Not up to 30. And after 30, they, they themselves say, if they get married, maximum they may have one child or something. And their population is coming down by a couple of lakhs every census actually. And they don't want migration. So it's not a very easy thing. The only thing I told them is sooner or later you will come in Discovery or Natural Geography Channel as a endangered species. You know, these are <laughs> Japanese, you know, they were shown. And now they are not. I took a CD from a friend here about Parsis, you know, how they are declining. Same way. Same thing. It is happening to Japan. Japanese companies are doing well. Don't confuse between the two things. <laughs> As the cut society, you know, Europe is facing acute problem actually. US is not because US is getting huge amount of people from Latino countries. Mexico is to US what Bangladesh is to India. Same thing. And they go on coming. Lot of uh, discussion, argument. Incidentally, such a highly developed country, even today, doesn't have a proper statistics of how many Latinos are there in US, illegally. Their population is of 36 crore or something. So they say that it could be 3 crore or 10 crore. That is the range with there. But one thing is sure, 25 percent to 30 percent of their GDP is due to these people who are from southern part. Of course, they tried so many things, you know, somebody told to shoot them, somebody told uh, don't allow them. Each state is a crackpot in US actually by itself because one state gives them uh, permission to drive cars and another state calls them undocumented aliens. Third state gives them permission to get the medical facility. So it's a very, I was in a seminar where somebody suggested you build a wall around you. That fellow has never seen US in the map or in the <laughs> above. He's an American actually. I told who will build that wall? Mexicans have to build the wall. There are no white Americans who are there to build the wall. And after building the wall, they will be this side of the wall. Then what will you do? <laughs> See, these are solutions. Everybody wants to have some. It cannot be because US businesses want them. Actually, everybody requires them, but nobody is willing to accept it. But Europe, same thing. Europe wants it, but uh, Europe needs it, but Europe cannot accept it. So that is a, they have a massive demographic problem. Coupled with another thing is, what is called in the financial jargon, they have this uh, longevity risk. People are living long. At 60 today, most of the European countries, 80 to 84 is the life expectancy. Pension provider is worried about life expectancy at 60, not at zero. After that, if it is 85, that means 25 years, they have to give pension to these people. It's a very, very major issue to them. So people are living long and there is no additional increment to population from below because if there is increment to population from below these fellows will pay some taxes and fill up the kitty and most of them are unfunded pension except us many of the european countries don't have funding they take it from the taxes highly taxed countries so the full uh, what one can call situation is in bad shape g7 we have given originally one billion dollar to them for them to overcome the 
crisis our uh, pm felt pangs of you know concern so that time it was 56 rupees roughly 1% of our gdp <coughs> recently i was told uh, our uh, uh, nac chairman national advisory council chairman she wanted 10 billion to be given to europe to overcome the crisis i do not know actually whether we have dispersed it or not that information is not still come out but we are the interesting part about it is even though we gave 1 billion not a single european paper wrote even four lines about it only lamond carried once sort of a satirical item they made it appear india was privileged to give it to europe see night on beggar comes i give some food to him whatever is left over he says sir you are very privileged today <laughs> you have done a huh? it's not that he is thanking me he is making me appear that i am blessed by like that so 10 billion one doesn't know again okay let's look at our current situation these are the data sources this is uh, what we have used exhaustive ones indian scene is very simple we have a huge portion of what is loosely called non corporate sector that name itself is funny because corporate is taken as granted so the other one is non corporate sector that some sort of a neti if you remember nachiketa he went you know is this the truth is this the truth he was told na na iti this is not the truth this is a peculiar way this is a way in which actually some of you may remember there is an 80 judgment of the supreme court which defined hindus as those who are not parsis jews christians and muslims finished <laughs> they broke their head and finally because everything somebody told vegetarian non vegetarian this and that and finally court told if you don't belong to these four faith you are a hindu <laughs> story is over right. you can't uh, uh, you know six jains buddhist all do have this all this uh, uh, scst fifth so many things anyhow so this is the way in which uh, we have to they have approximately 45 to 50% of our gdp is something which is phenomenal actually in either country this would be treated as something mean but the most interesting part is in us they have something like 6 to 7% so they are called residual sector there so here also we call them residual india is the only country where 50% become <laughs> residual why because they call it like that sir that's all companies have 15% of gdp all corporate sector 7.8 lakh to you uh, know nearly 7.8 or 8 lakh companies are there in the country entire group put together will be 15% of that 8000 or so companies are proudly listed in the stock exchange 8000 plus we always claim that of that 50% last year didn't have a single transaction right what we call million abhiman news in indian share bazaar this crowd at least will know who are abhiman news right i am sure and like my students you know somebody asked who is this mr abhiman news sir is a very you know created chaos in the class actually this girl suddenly stood up sir abhiman you mentioned who is that gentleman immediately tell another person from there he told no you don't know he comes in that story then she asked which story right whether the sari removed or lady kidnapped which story you are this went on in the class okay. then i told stop this is my story my karma that i have come to impart uh, capital market knowledge to you so all these listed companies 8000 companies right we call about but hardly what 150 to 200 will be very active if you take it doesn't matter they may be having something like 5 to 6% of the gdp share only not more than that and uh, us we mention 80% is their share corporate share and 7% is the share of these people then the government another more interesting thing quickly fdi and fii put together has never crossed 7% in india you take up any newspaper in the last couple of years or television channel dealing with business it will look as if this is the major issue 
a DNFI, where it's coming, where will it come? And now that also very narrowly focused. Will multi-brand FDI will be? Hello, that is the acid test of whether you are can run the country or not. <laughs> Will Walmart be allowed? First question. If you say no, fill it. You are anti-business, anti-this, anti-that. You are thrown out, right? So this is the, so our ability to focus on inconsequential and immaterial is phenomenal, I am telling you. FDI and FI are critical. It's something like pickle to curd rice. People who are from south at least will appreciate what I am telling. Pickle to curd rice. But that has been made into curd rice. It is required, but it is a side dish. It's an important thing. I am not denying the important, but we shouldn't make it. That means 93% of our domestic investment comes from domestic saving. And of that, you will be surprised, 80% of the is household saving. Somebody asked me, who is responsible for India's growth? Average Indian housewife is responsible for India's growth should put a statue of her from what I am to Kohima, one lady standing like this, you know. Below that you write, responsible for our growth. Unknown lady, like unknown soldier, you know, we have. They are the ones who are, and it's not a joke I am telling, particularly in the last five to six years, phenomenal amount of uh, uh, budgeting in the household side because of inflation. Huge amount. You know, don't go by those numbers, 12 percent, 15 percent or that. Sometimes the specific item inflation is, I say, 60 to 70 percent. If you look at it on a concrete way. Vegetable prices have gone up unbelievable. I remember year before last year used to take something like 50, 60 rupees for 3-4 days of purchase of two people at home. Today, anything less than 200 rupees, I cannot move. And to the extent you also see, you don't have to have, you know, big uh, finance minister speech and other thing. Formerly 100 rupee was very difficult with the vegetable vendor to get change and other thing. Today 100 has become nothing. 500 you give, you will. So, in that context, our saving is something unbelievable, right? It's actually, our Domestic saving rate is 30-32 percent. We are looking at Europe and US, you know, where it's 1 percent, 2 percent, and 30-32 percent actually. We are one of the highest saving in the world. Household saving is phenomenal actually. And now some of these uh, uh, foreign experts are telling, we are saving too much. <laughs> you should spend. The same fellows are telling you are not saving enough in the 60s. Now they are telling you are saving too much. Actually, this uh, uh, expert, you know, our friend in uh, Stanford, uh, what is that, uh, Bhagavati, he came during the last NDA period. He told, you must evolve method for Indian women to spend. You are unnecessarily saying. The point is, why, you know, people are not, uh, you know, what do you call, just like that, saving or anything. Particularly when any, something is done by Indian woman, it has to be based upon significant rationality and uh, foresightedness. Give these two to them, I am telling you, seriously. Why do they save? 85 percent are non-corporate, non-government employees in this country. What does it mean? They are not covered by any mandated old age social security scheme. They have to take care of themselves. If you are running a small shop at, uh, you know, 55 or 65, you get a heart problem, you have to spend from your pocket. If you are a, you know, single track operator, you have to do that also. If you are a petrol pump owner, you have to do that. There is no other. And many of them are not covered by any of these, uh, you know, insurance or anything. So that is the one of the most important thing. Why do people see? And in the context of declining joint family, all of us are aware that it was not as it used to be in the 50s, where you know you can always depend upon some uh, uh, what one can call brothers or you know uncles or aunts. Nothing. You have to. Second is health related. Again the same thing. US or Europe, you can get into the uh, universal health schemes. Right. We do not have any such schemes. If again you have to pay for your own, 
So you have to, and again our life expectancy at 60 is now 73. So 13 years you have to, assuming you, and for self-employed people there is nothing called retirement. Many of them actually do their business till their death actually. So our life expectancy has also increased. So we have to save for old age, we have to save for health reason. Third is education. Not many people think about it. Why do people say? I had a long argument with these experts. Education is very expensive today in India. Youngsters at least will know what I am talking about. UKG or LKG cost a fortune today. You to enter there. And you have to pay a lump sum. And over and above harassment. Parents have to study because they are interviewed. <laughs> Grand and say, say mother should be graduate. In one place in uh, Bangalore, they told mother should be postgraduate. <laughs> this lady was uh, really struggling hard to somewhere get you know some of those certificate at least. <laughs> and uh, you know they were talking about something like 1.5 lakh to 2 lakh as a initial board money, and then monthly fee of uh, you know 1500 to 2000. If you have two two children. And for this you don't get any loan from banks. They give loan for IIT, IIM, and not for UKG. It's very peculiar actually. I was on the bank but I used to argue, no, you don't give loan for foundation for the house. Second and third floor you are. <laughs> they say, no sir, education is very expensive. I'm and on an average, Asian women and Indian women more particularly are obsessed with their children's education. I use the word obsessed with very, they are very, very, they want the, the children to go to the best school and unfortunately in India best school is associated with the highly priced schools, value and so they are very, very and they keep track also, which she, what he is studying, what he, other day I asked some man, you know, what is your, he told sixth class, then the boy told, Appa, I am already in the eighth class. <laughs> this father doesn't even keep track of which class he is <laughs> studying. And a lot of studies are there, why women, Asian women are. Also. One of the reasons for Indian women is, every Indian woman want her children to be better than her husband. Let us be very, very uh, <laughs> clear about it. Right? You ask them, you scrap them, you ask them, they will agree. right? Because this cannot be rectified anymore. It's like, it's like, you know, old ambassador car, you know, it, you can neither sell it nor, uh, you know, do donate it. It's all right. It's, you know, you love antique furniture, so that also is there. Here and there you can move around and keep it. So how do you take the vengeance and make it better? Sometimes I have heard them telling, don't be like a study well. And because. Uh, because she is one of the privileged who would have given seen his certificate that he was a third class pass or whatever it is. <laughs> Nobody else would have. So this is something. And the fourth is the samskaras. Lot of people spend lot of money on marriages of relatives, the birth, death and other things. And poorer segments spend more money proportionately than richer ones. Richer ones may send an SMS, very sorry to hear you have died and you know, it's all right. Without realizing SMS won't read that fellow. It's already gone. But I have seen lot of poorer people taking a bus or train, going to their village, buying you know, saris and buying dhotis and I always used to ask, why do you have to spend so much? He says, if I don't spend, who will spend for us, spend for them. So all these... Uh, rituals related spending. So if you take old age worries, health worries, education of children and the samskaras, all these four, you have to save 25 to 30 percent at least. There is no other way in our country. In the absence of any other support system actually, the fifth one is for people who are in this type of business, what is called the corruption or bribery. That is very, very important and there you have to pay. There is no other and that also has to be coming out of your saving. Where else it could, right? For instance, two major problem of this group is corruption and lack of credit. My flower under, actually the whole focus on this itself came out of her. Every day morning, she is a vegetable seller also. Every day morning, she comes around 7 o'clock near my home. 
she comes in a TVS 50. Half of the truck load she brings in that, I don't know how she <laughs> manages. And uh, she starts the shop 7 to night 9. Sometime her husband may also join her, sometime, you know, otherwise. 24 by 7 throughout the year. Except one or two days she may go to her village or. Oh, I was fascinated actually. Where, where does she come in our economic system? So I went to probe and started reading about where do they come and everything and I finally found out she is categorized as unorganized sector in India. I was aghast actually. She is much better organized than many MNCs. <laughs> she knows exactly inventory, she knows the credit, she knows the customer, you know all this. And uh, further I read the government document and my blood pressure increased. <laughs> You know why? The government is put as organized sector. <laughs> she is categorized as unorganized. Government is organized. Totally disorganized fellows are sitting there and they have classified themselves as organized. I have nearby one municipal council, Bambanali municipality, our area. Such a level of disorganization. But they have classified themselves as organized. No, what does this mean? This, I, I call all this as terminological terrorism. <laughs> there is one type of terrorism. You know why? Unorganized means you are disorganized. And you should be made organized. They, them, they themselves do not know that they are called unorganized actually. And in general talk immediately people will say all unorganized groups will be. <coughs> Bank meetings I have seen people telling. Unorganized we should not. An actual practice most of these people, I have, I can tell you with uh, confidence, the NPA proportion is relatively small. It's very interesting actually. In educational loan, for example, the NPA is highest among people who come from best institutions. Not uh, people who are, people who are coming from some of the premier institutions, IITs, IIMs, NITs and all these, NPA level is very high. And all these fellows get good yeah. jobs. Right? See, in those days I remember I used to be young and innocent. I am still innocent. I am not young. <laughs> so they used to register and come and uh, bank used to be in our campus itself. It used to be in those days 60 to 100 students only. One group. I am talking about 80s. Our fee used to be 3000 rupees. Annual fee. So they will come and uh, I will also, we will sign. Much later only I realized I have signed as guarantor to many of these <laughs> people. I didn't know that. I have signed it. And <laughs> they are all gone. Suddenly in the mid-90s I got a letter from some banks that if you don't pay within one month your house, car, dogs, wife, everything will be. <laughs> I was shocked actually. How will I be without my dogs? Leave alone everything else, right? <laughs> so, the point I want to st these fellows are in very good job. And one fellow who is owning a huge enterprise in San Jose as well as in uh, this side of Boston, he came to India and somebody like uh, Suketa's uh, stage, he was talking about business ethics. I stood outside and caught hold of his collar first. You repay your bank loan first. After that, you because I am the guarantor. So, why I want to stress is, we have seen lot of these Istri fellows, flower vendors and all these groups. Actually, they are much more prompt and they repay it. Even though people, again, you know, lot of studies have demonstrated. One of the reasons is not that they know all the legal uh, thing. They are even now afraid of God. They are fearful of God, not loss. And the better off segment amongst us, what we have become, we are neither worried about law nor about God. We are all secular, so we are not interested, worried about God. Laws, of course, why should we worry about law? You know, if somebody is caught that uh, cop, immediately ask, do you know who is my father? I never understand, particularly in Delhi type of places, it's very common. Why should you ask the policeman about your father? You should go home and 
If you have serious doubt, you should go home, right? <laughs> but he will ask. Then he feels that he wants the law. Right? So the lack of credit is the major issue for these groups. See, my flower elder, she borrows at half a percent per day. Don't try to convert it even. And all my surveys in among these groups, provision fellow, this barber, this uh, hotel fellows, all of them, anywhere between today's rate in Bangalore, 3 to 4 percent per month. They don't talk about annual at all. Very rarely they talk about annual. Mostly it is at that. Three to, see the other rate, what we are talking about of uh, this RBI or Raghuram Rajan announcement, and they are not applicable to large portions of this country. Good on newspaper and other thing, prime lending rate and other thing. It is not applicable to these groups at all. Phenomenal amount of interest burden falls on them. For instance, uh, it comes in the book. Very approximately 17% of our GDP is uh, uh, trade, retail trade. It's slightly higher than manufacturing. Retail trade is one of the major chunk of our, and that's why the global retail is very enthusiastic about it. Retail chain is a very big thing. So on a 80,000 crore, uh, 80 lakh crores last year, something like 15% uh, even if I take, something like 12 lakh crores would have been the turn of the uh, retail trade. 12 lakh crores was the turnover of the retail trade, value added of the retail trade. And uh, retail trade, almost all their requirement is only working capital requirement. They don't require, uh, you know, there is no plant, machinery or building or nothing. Inventory, sales and payment to the supplier. So out of this 12 lakh crore, 10 lakh crore at least would have been required for them. If you look at the entire organized banking, cooperative bank, scheduled commercial bank, everything put together, hardly 2 lakh crore was given. So the remaining has come from non-bank sources, from money lenders, from chips and various other groups actually, out of much, much higher rates. That is the first and foremost issue faced by them. Right? Second is what we call the corruption. See, out of a 300-400 rupee turnover, some of these uh, I was talking about, something like 20 rupee per day at least goes away for meeting the requirement of corruption. Some way or other. It can be the local cop, it can be the local goon, you know, they take it up. And there are lot of low level regulation which we don't even focus at. Shops and Establishment Act. It's a draconian regulation to harass people. Every one of you must read Maharashtra Shops and Establishment Act. Karnataka I have read this much fact. You won't believe. Shops should have sunshine. How many shops you have seen in sunshine? And it should be in a healthy, very good. It should not be having all these drainage and other things. Typically, you see, I stand on this side, there is a nala, you know, there is a drainage. Other side of the shop, I buy bread from him and come back daily. He should not do business. Rat should not be there in the shop. Have you believe that small retail shop, rat should not be present. Seating arrangement should be there. Madness. Why have we done this? I tell you one thing, I am more and more increasingly convinced. Many of these regulations is to generate money for the government employees. Seriously. Nothing else other than that. Because if you go by this regulation, all the shops in Karnataka should be closed. No other alternative. But why do we keep that? Because every time this fellow will go, he will come to so-called inspection and then he will collect some money. And sometimes it has been regularized. Like we have one Idli fellow nearby, the Food and Adult, you might have heard about it, Food and Adulteration Act. That is another draconian act. Frankenstein monsters, these fellows, these corporation fellow, the way they come, when they enter itself, it is adulteration actually, the shop. Will, that fellow puts in an envelope of 500 rupees and he gives it. I ask him why do you want to give sir otherwise he can create problem for me. 
Friday evening you will come and close the shop. I can't even go to court till Monday. And Saturday, Sundays are my peak business days. Right? So very draconian. I asked, I was in some group. I asked the responsible uh, government official, has anybody died in Bangalore eating in any of these hotels? He said, no. Stomach upset told me, sir. That will come at uh, eating at home also. Nothing. What I wanted to say was this act can be scrapped. Nothing will happen. Very simple because if some problem arises out of eating in one place, other fellows won't go there. Simple. This, you don't require a and the six inspectors and you know, unbelievable actually. Many of them are crorepatis and uh, very often you know we read in the newspaper one uh, lower level clerk was uh, you know Lokaita raided him and found some 25 crores or something of assets. Huge amount of money is generated. So they have innumerable number of these type of regulatory framework which is actually chaining all these fellows. And what do they do? They pay. What else they will do? You tell me. And uh, in the sense this has become a common thing and it is accepted now. So what according to me we have created a situation over a period of time where we have entangled ourselves into this web of corruption. And so when that is alone is tackled then your growth rate falls good amount of our growth rate comes out of these things. So there is a huge amount of resentment. For instance, everybody talking about Santosh Ekde, how great he has done and other thing. In the so-called Bellari Reddy Brothers here. You go to Bellari, 30,000 people at least are willing to lynch that uh, Ekde if he comes there. They are unemployed. They have all become, because you have stopped, you go to Goa. Tremendous amount of hatred again court. You go to Madurai, you know this uh, granite, 20-25, what has happened is over a period of time we have tied ourselves into phenomenal amount of knots. So what I want to stress is you can't even fight corruption in a sort of a segmented way. There is no other, you have to scrap many of these regulations and what what would be a Correct, idea. but they could have, you know, either you have to have alternative, they should have asked the government to run it for some time. Just, you know, just stopping is not a issue at all, if you ask me. Right. And now they have come with some quantitative norms and other things. That's not going to... We are in such stage of development, I am telling you, you cannot but have these predatory fellows. In other words, we are exactly where the Europe and the US were in the 1910s and 1920s. McInnes Gold, one film some of you might have seen in your younger days. We are exactly in that type of a situation. It's a very complicated situation. So if you segmented fashion, if you try to attack one, it will have a severe amount of impact. Some of these lower level thing, if you ask me, it can quietly be withdrawn or scrapped. Nothing will happen. Because we have created, for instance, I will tell you an example. Uh, last, uh, day before yesterday, I was analyzing the Tamil Nadu budget. 1 lakh crore is the approximate budget. 40,000 crore is paid for salary wages. You know, you know, something like 1.2% of the population of Tamil Nadu is supported by 7.5 crore people unsustainable actually. If you add interest, pensions and other things, it comes to nearly 60-65%. There is absolutely no money left with state governments to do any other activity. In the past, they used to open some, you know, sheep rearing corporation, wool uh, preparing something, ribbon cut, nothing is happening. But the alternative, what they have done is this uh, opening up liquor shops. That's the largest source of revenue today, more than commercial taxes. So on one side you drink, give us money, on the other side we will give you mixy. So this, you know, this sort of a cycle we have created, what I call the vulnerable dependency cycle or in other words loosely called families are getting nationalized in India. Families are getting nationalized and business is getting privatized. Well, families are getting nationalized means what everything you depend on 
government. The one television interview, one girl, young girl who was uh, maybe second or third standard asked, who is giving you education in Tamil channel? She told her, Amma, not her mother. Her mother and her father, she doesn't even recognize. She is giving me education and food. So this is the it's a phenomenal amount of issue. So we will, uh, this is the Indian growth is primarily due to partnership proprietorship firms. We must recognize this. There is no going away from it. And in manufacturing, you will be surprised. 50% of the manufacturing out, uh, value addition comes from them. 5 <coughs> Not any less or anything. And it is domestic saving finance. So if we have to focus, we have to focus how to enlarge the scope of domestic saving. And all that, you know, many of these, uh, you know, the global economies quickly come, capital output ratio is 4. So you are, uh, we require 40 percent investment. Our saving is only 30 percent. So 10 percent has to come from. Much of it is actually spurious. This capital output ratio itself can be questioned actually. Because our non-corporate uses capital phenomenally efficiently, believe me. This capital output we tell bus for instance a board is written. 40 people can sit and 5 people can stand. That is the capital to output, right? You tell me which bus goes like that. <laughs> there are buses in Calcutta, I have seen all around there are like garland people. I don't know. Suddenly I find a huge mass of people moving. Somebody told sir, there is a bus <laughs> inside. I'm not joking. Several places, same thing, trains sometimes you find, you know. In taxi, long distance in UP, Bihar, almost all the states I have found, on the right side of the driver there are one or two fellows sitting. You don't know who is driving that bloody vehicle. I always ask who is the cone driver. No sir, I guess it's muddy. It's all right. It's... And they will say move a little more because I have to put the break. I have to put this. What is this here? And in statistics we only take uh, four, pe three people behind and uh, two people in the front. And then measure the cap. This whole idea of capital output ratio has to be relooked. And again, let me tell compared to large corporates, these businesses use it enormously efficiently because it, their livelihood depends on it and they cannot afford to waste. And as I told you, they have to spend money on corruption. See, big corporates can have huge departments and call by different names public relation, corporate, this and that. And basically, they will all be used in convincing various government uh, departments that this is what we are doing and but the small fellows cannot afford to even have it actually and so we have a flourishing you know uh, what you call chartered accountants and lawyers a society where these two groups are flourishing I am one of them <laughs> is in DK tell me take my word for it if chartered accountants and lawyers are the most flourishing people, that society is in deep trouble. Who should be flourishing? Musicians, teachers. <laughs> Correct? So, but who will bother, right? So, another thing is, of course, which we will not spend much time now. Many of these uh, smaller grouping, the caste has also played a very important role as a social capital provider. Huge amount of borrowing lending is done within the community, actually. There are a lot of documented studies for it also. Tirupur, one of the towns near in uh, Tamil Nadu, actually, which has something like, what, 1,500 crores of turnover. One single community has been able to develop that, actually. And mostly based upon the uh, risk capital appetite within the group. And uh, this is something which we have elaborated in our... So what is to be focused? What should be the focus of the new government? 
yeah this is one area which is highly talked about so we will bold everybody pounces on this you know people say that you know seminars are held and finance minister say don't buy gold and the seminar people are talking and their wives are in the <laughs> workshop one third of the world gold we are buying from 1916 Why 1916? From that time, data is available. <laughs> right. The thing, you know, we have been, and this debate is going on. Gold is unproductive. Gold should not be bought. It will be interesting to some of you. 1911, there was a huge debate in uh, uh, one of the Bengali papers. I read it in English about it. About uh, the girls not showing interest in buying gold. 1911. so some of these people told what will happen whether gold itself will nothing will happen 2020 we are we had the period of 1962 to 1991 where we banned import of gold some of you may remember gold control order but people were buying gold let me be very clear about it most of you have been alive in that period right we are not stopped by gold what that what did the order do that order created people like daud ibrahim if you ask me one single government law which is the root cause of global terrorism that is that order gold control order of 1961 why do people buy gold they are not you know fundamentally very simple it's a pension and insurance products for large number of poorer women in india people don't realize the proportionate to the income poorer spend more on buying gold because that's the only asset which which they can relate you tell me they can't relate with uh, you know options on future or anything or even bond shares no bank very difficult large number of them this is the most easiest thing to and particularly when children are capacious they are left with at least their gold actually there is a superstition it is called my friend zimmerman used to always say it is not a superstition it's an economic principle that you are not supposed to remove your mangal sutra till the husband dies he says it's a very good principle because she is left with that at least which with she can carry on her so the poorer segment this is the insurance and pension product that's a fundamental principle which we are not getting it and why it is popular because you can buy very small quantities when i give my servant maid another 3000 rupee for diwali or something she immediately goes by one earring small one i tell her why do you invest in this no oh, sir after four or five earrings i will make it into a bangle so it is divisible and third most important is it doesn't have any government control bequeathing is very easy because possession is ownership in india the bahu comes and if she is given a chain and if he holds it tight it is hers it can't be nowhere yakta kapoor will not agree with that if i tell it can be taken back right it's hers that's all there is no other no document if you see households with four five women each one will have a her own jewel box it will be clear who <coughs> they may be using that is a different issue but everyone knows who is what so it is very easy to pass it on to the next generation the fascinating thing is for the book on pension future we did a study of 15000 people all over the country we did a reasonably large sample of doctors lawyers accountants farmers youngsters software all these people we found something very interesting we asked one of the among various other question how much gold is your wife having 95% of the husband did not have a clue to that those who are here can now think about it the bills they didn't have any clue to that seriously i'm telling some told 40 gram actually their wife said something like 4000 gram some told 400 gram it's a, you know like the standard deviation was very high or variance or whatever you call fluctuations was so high see when the husband do not know the stock of gold you know how the government of india can do <laughs> i cannot understand at all they used to say 18000 ton 
that was macquarie came and did a study and so 18000 ton it so recently i met the deputy governor of rba and i just pulled this like what is the current stock after that trivandrum temple got opened do you tell me he says sir professor you are very mischievous right so current stock cannot be it's not very easy to so it's a huge but it's also a hidden reserve for the country i tell you again if you have a credible leader and a noble cause people will come and give this 62 i remember in the jeep kamraj rajaji and others came in the streets of chennai i was in school that time 63 many ladies actually removed their bangles and gave post to chinese war you won't believe this actually my aunt was one of them who used to be my uncle permanently used to shout at her why did you do that you know in a spur of a moment she lots of people gave it actually without any right but because they felt these are credible leaders and a noble cause today if they come in jeep people will hold it and <laughs> will be worried that this fellow will take it away right this is, like other day i was coming in the airport some uh, one cabinet minister was going from bangalore with five six uh, you know spg around him so one young girl told her mother are you hot dudda color ho idare big dacoit is going because she thought if seven of the police is around him he should be a her mom was telling which don't i told no she is telling the correct thing so i am convinced now one thing the spg protection for leaders is to protect us from them kindly remember this very important don't criticize that leaders have got lot of this how more please because your pocket will not be picked at least so if there is a why i am telling it is what is called in the jargon one of the great hidden resource of india very great hidden resource for individual families as well as a, for the country as a whole i think what we should have done which we never did we should have leveraged on our power of buying gold when you buy one third of a commodity we should be actually on the head of the table in the world gold council we should be dictating terms on price we should be dictating terms on quantity produced we never did that because we decided it is unproductive that is what the left economy is told in those days buying gold is unproductive where is the strength of walmart because of their purchasing power so we should have leveraged on it throughout the 70s 80s and other thing accepted and uh, we didn't do that actually we missed the bus we should be one of the major players in the world gold market simply out of our requirement and buy we could have created banks for buying gold streamlined it maybe three four banks and then locally redistribute it or sell it and global level we could have also had a significant amount of strength we never did that actually so this is not uh, you know there is no point in just mentioning about uh, indian women are doing some foolish thing never ever if somebody says indian women are doing fool never ever believe them when indian women does something it has to be right at least 1 2 3 how many quickly count right i have got support here right so huh so why did the west fail why we are mentioning this again is we shouldn't see nationalization of families that's not going to lead us anywhere from cradle to grave or womb to tomb everything will be taken care by the government so for instant i'll give you a simple example hundreds of you know 300 beggars were there in a beggar home in bangalore two year before i don't know why they all ran out of the beggar home they had some complaint food was not uh, uh, enough for something it's all right they were roaming in bangalore and all the tv fellows one fellow took even a helicopter and took the photos big debates were there everybody was telling what government of karnataka is doing what government of india is doing right and uh, our friend arna bas nation should no answer nation should no so somebody thrust a mic before me i told what about their uncles aunts father mother cousins brothers what are they doing why are you not asking that question most of them are able bodied fellows also 
first of all why are they in that home i do not know first of why they are kept there and fed and that person knows sir this type of question we don't want you blame will you blame karnataka government you ask me frankly that is what i have put the like for this is where we have landed ourselves if i sneeze then immediately government of india will be blamed what i doing how are you allowing an iim professor to sneeze nation must know <laughs> Crazy thing. If I sneeze, I, you know, my relatives, friends, the doctor should be asked, right? In other words, completely shifting the entire responsibility to the state, and that is what is a right-based society will lead us to. Everything is right-based. There is another dirty four-letter word, duty. It is completely deleted, actually. Nobody talks about it. Everybody has got a right. Cockroaches have rights. This is got right. Ants have got right. Right. So this is the saving is forgotten. Family have and family is decline. I tell you, economic growth automatically take place for some time. Obviously, because uh, US used to have 4.3 as the average family size in the 50s. Today it has become around 2.1 or something. Europe it is lower than that. Obviously, when you are you know smaller, then you have. more refrigerator more television more uh, soaps are sold actually so large businesses always want smaller families they would not appreciate joint families and joint family would be looked down upon will be criticized actually by the large it's a interest of the large business but within its own this development there is a seeds of problem the smaller and smaller family become the responsibility gets more and more shifted to government it has to take care of the interest so that's what we call in terms of right based society duties are forgotten relationship based and everything is rules and contract based they are still significantly relationship based society and they themselves agree of course now multiculturalism has failed and that is why this uh, our uh, famous friend cameron declared uk united kingdom is a christian country that should be recognized but too late in the day because london is called londonistan by themselves not by others so he says it's a christian country but uh, time is over so lawyers and accountants and doctors also i have included here system is decaying that's not a very desirable system and our growth is first it is not a global crisis let's be very clear it's an anglo saxon crisis it's no need for us to shed tears only major advantage is funds will come to india take my word for it because today funds are in search of markets markets are not in search of funds this we should internalize funds will not go anywhere else and longevity is increasing they have to earn somewhere and pension funds are the largest funds in europe and us 18 trillion is the last count us dollar where it will go today you tell me it can't go to rwanda it can't go to you know ukraine it can't go to syria you see the world map we are reasonably common quite society so funds will have to come to india but let us have them nothing wrong about it on our terms that's the only thing they will bully it's all right we should counter bully when pepsi and coke went to china china only one condition do not talk about human rights in china last fight nobody talks about human rights in china in us so walmart can come here nothing wrong but us congress can pass a resolution telling that uh, other side of jammu and kashmir aksai chain maybe afghanistan i don't know whatever all are part of india <laughs> you pass it then walmart can come that's all see very simple these are business and uh, commerce and politics all should be combined nothing wrong about it why can they do it yes hillary is going to stand in the coming thing and she was the director of walmart can you remember every us company has got huge amount of business uh, what you call the congressional link at least 15 to 20 congress fellow would have in some time or other linked to that so funds will come to are in search of market are we in a 
every position to take care of our interest and bring the funds. Nothing wrong about it. You scrap this, you scrap that, we will, you know, here and there. Right? US Commission on all this religious uh, freedom and other thing, you scrap that commission. And between you and me, US will do it. Because for them, you know, ROI is more critical than all these, uh, what you call, moral posturing and other thing. They, they are particularly Republicans are very clear, ROI is the final thing in the world. This other side, Democrat here and there, they will be making some noise. They will write some articles and other things. That's all right. You write more articles in New York Times. We encourage you. Right. So that's only. So funds are in search of market. And uh, so we have to sort of uh, recognize this. India story is just beginning, what we tell. Right? So agenda is we should actually think beyond this, uh, you know, old debate of Marx, market and all that thing. That's enough of that debate. We are for market. We have always been for market. The whole country, what I call is uh, getting Vaishyavization. Everybody is becoming a Baniya in our country today. Everybody is a Baniya. Government actually should be a Kshatriya and that is also Baniya. In business, individual government employees are all banias. In uh, business, without capital, because of their position and regulation. So, whole thing is uh, we have to think in terms of protect and preserve families. That's something which we should keep in mind. Vaishyavization is taking place. Huge entrepreneur. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. This entrepreneurship development program I never understand. In a country where 85% are entrepreneurs. <laughs> you must have programs for training people to be good employees. If you want me to. <laughs> right. I am again, you know, in uh, various management institute, this is, I am always puzzled actually. Why do you have these stupid programs? Everybody is a born entrepreneur in our country. They can, hey, we have entrepreneur from, uh, what do you call this, Mardabad from what, 300 uh, rupees to, <laughs> how much it is, I don't know, 3000 crore? <laughs> right. It's a very bangle making place, brass and bangle making place. You become a big fellow. Right. And the credit delivery should be the... <laughs> right. Huh? Don't tell the name. <laughs> Actually, some of you know Telugu may be knowing. Vadra means don't do. So she has been telling Vadra, Vadra, Vadra without knowing, you know, that what he is understanding it in different. Anyhow. So credit delivery, I think, should be the primary focus. We must enhance the credit delivery to these groups. And uh, just by depending on this commercial bank is not going to help. We have to create institution or we have to encourage non-bank institution in a proper developmental focus and uh, immediately, you know, we don't mean to say that, you know, let million Saharas, uh, what you call, uh, blossom. Sahara cannot blossom, right? It's a desert, right? So it cannot. Uh, so we must, you know, what I mean to say, the requirement has to be understood and uh, appropriate developmental. And these so-called panchayat and other should local level colleges, schools, banks, hospital, every everything should be run by the local fellows. Actually, our focus should be that, not in terms of uh, jobs in government. Uh, that's not uh, this whole idea of you know enlarged jobs in government is not going to work. We must obviously increase nurture the savings. Huge amount of uh, benefit can be given to this sector as well as the earning households, right? You know, instead of they can, be, if you ask me, you know, something like up to 10 lakh, there need not be any worry about taxation at all. We have 1.5 trillion sitting in various global tax havens. Nobody talks about it. Huge amount, actually. Nobody bothers about it. Here, uh, locally, you know, we are harassing all these uh, fellows who are. You know, who cannot even respond or who have to go to our and say some, do something about. I see guys. you also. Very nice. That is what it happens, right? So, we shouldn't create a huge society of single parent family. That's something which we have to be very cautious about. So, social security, to some extent only state, we say our numbers are also very large. 1.2 billion is not a joke. The government cannot really take over the 
responsibility. So that is where we should quickly cover in this. And I would like all of you to buy the book and go through it. Right? And then so many other facets of this uh, will also be coming out. Right? Thank you very much.